Well, welcome everyone to this AFC talk called The Impact of Deep Fakes on Societies and Institutions. I'm Cecil McCarthy, a distinguished lecturer at Hunter College, and I'm so excited to be here with you all to learn more about this very important topic. Now, according to the cybersecurity firm Sensicity, deep fakes are growing exponentially and doubling every six months. Now, so far, there are about 85,000 deep fakes uh, out there, according to Sensicity, um, circulating online. 90% of those are pornographic. But, but deep fake creators are fast expanding their portfolio. And just recently, there have been several high profile deep fakes depicting Tom Cruise, Queen Elizabeth, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, even former President Donald Trump. So while there are many potential benefits of this technology, the dangers are obvious. Imagine scrolling through social media and seeing a deep fake briefing by a government official that contains dangerous disinformation. Very soon in the future, it may be difficult to identify that video as a fake. So I don't think it's hyperbole to say that deep fakes could become a serious misinformation threat or even a national security threat. Luckily, we have two experts here today to take us on a deep dive on deep fakes. Joining us are Alyssa Soom and Ashish Jamin. Alyssa is a project manager for Microsoft's Defending Democracy program and focuses on efforts to counter misinformation and disinformation. She's involved in developing technical policy and media literacy solutions to disinformation. And before joining Microsoft, Alyssa spent several years working on US State Department exchange programs and spent some time in London where she earned a master's degree in social policy from the London School of Economics. Also joining us, Ashish Jamin. He is a hands-on technologist and innovator, currently a director of technology and operations for customer security and trust at Microsoft. He's also working on the Defending Democracy program and focuses on helping customers improve their cybersecurity against disinformation and deep fakes. Alyssa and Ashish have a presentation for us now, which will be followed by a Q&A, so hold on to your questions. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Alyssa and Ashish. Great, thank you so much, Cecil. Um, I am going to share my screen here with the slide deck that we have. Let me know when you can see it okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, so as Cecil mentioned, my name is Alyssa Soom. I am a project manager with Microsoft's Defending Democracy program. Um, we view deep fakes and disinformation, especially through a political lens and the impact that it has on uh, democratic institutions and societies. Um, countering disinformation is just one aspect of our work alongside our efforts um, to protect political campaigns and parties from cyber attacks uh, to protect the integrity of the voting process and elections themselves. Um, so like I said, we, we take this approach of um, looking at the impact that deep fakes have on uh, democracies and political processes. So I'd like to start with um, just some definitions of terms to make sure that we're on the same page about what we're even talking about. Um, and definitions are one place where there's uh, a, a need for standardization and how we talk about disinformation. Um, a great example of this being the term deep fake itself, which uh, the underlying technology used to create deep fakes is, is not necessarily inherently malicious as Cecil alluded to uh, in her introduction. But of course, in you know, common usage today, deep fake has taken on the meaning of malicious synthetic media um, uh, specifically. So as you can see on this slide, the way that we think about this issue area is based on the intent to cause harm. Um, starting on, on the left side of the screen, we have misinformation, which is the um, less harmful end of, end of the spectrum. This includes things like just general uh, mistakes, editorial errors, maybe missing context or uh, inaccurate captions, um, even some forms of comedy and satire when, when taken seriously by the audience. And we would generally say that, you know, this is not uh, as big of an issue, but certainly if misinformation is identified should be corrected uh, to avoid confusion and avoid amplification online. The 
more uh, malicious and the more harmful issue areas are disinformation and malinformation, um, which are really defined by the intent to cause harm. So disinformation is content that is either partially or wholly fabricated by the creator um, and then distributed with the explicit intent to deceive the audience. Um, moving even further into uh, harmful content, malinformation is a term that you might be a little bit less familiar with, but we think it's an important distinction in this space uh, because it refers to the deliberate release of private or sensitive information. So that includes things like revenge and non-consensual pornography, um, hacks and leaks, uh, harassment, certain forms of hate speech, um, and that is where really the, the most uh, impact can be in terms of the harms that are inflicted on individuals. So when we're thinking about deep fakes as an issue area, um, they can fall into any of these categories. Our focus is, is really on the disinformation and malinformation use cases um, and trying to mitigate those threats. So I'd like to show a video that you may have seen in the news recently. Um, let me see if I get this to play. What's up, TikTok? You guys cool if I play some sports? one example that um, I'm sure you've seen in the news recently that is especially alarming in terms of the sophistication uh, used in, in creating those videos. Um, as you saw in that video, TikTok uh, actually did not take these videos down on the grounds that they did not cause harm. Um, and this brings us to one of the core ethical questions around deepfakes, which it's one thing to theoretically talk about the intent to cause harm, but how do we actually enforce that um, in practice, and there's a lot of gray areas um, with, with this technology. So I've pulled some recent headlines here that involve deep fake technology um, that kind of further exemplify this point. There's a new app called Deep Nostalgia where you can animate photos of your ancestors and the, you know, the company really promotes the ability to reconnect with lost loved ones, which is wonderful, but of course raises some ethical, ethical um, questions about how do you gain consent from you know, deceased individuals and would they actually want their likeness to be recreated using AI? Um, a headline that ho hopefully the ethics are a little bit more clear on this one, um, a cheerleader's mom, I, I believe in Pennsylvania, was accused of creating deep fakes of her daughter's rivals. Um, I pulled this headline just because I think this is an alarming uh, new way that we're seeing this technology used and um, hopefully not one that, that is prominent. Um, ahead of the US elections, there was a video that was actually created as a public service announcement and an educational tool, uh, deep fake Putin um, speaking to Americans, but again, raises some questions around, you know, uh, even if there was good intent, this is still deceiving the audience uh, who's, who's viewing it. Um, and then finally, I think one of the most interesting examples we've seen internationally, an Indian politician last year used this technology to translate his speeches into other languages and reach more voters. And on the one hand, um, this is certainly a, a way that politicians could reach more of their constituent base in their native language. Um, but again, uh, brings up some questions around deceiving the audience and, and 
to what extent the audience knows that they're viewing a deep fake. So I'll cover a little bit about um, types of deep fakes, how the technology is used, um, and then how we conceptualize harms. Um, there's actually many different types of manipulations that are considered deep fakes. Um, this term was first coined on Reddit in 2017 to describe the most common use of this technology, which is face swapping. Um, at the time, face swapping was being used to put the faces of female celebrities into pornographic videos, um, and non-consensual pornography is still the overwhelming use case of this technology today, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, similar technique is lip syncing, uh, where someone's facial expressions and mouth are manipulated to make it appear as though they're speaking or appear as though they're saying something that they are not actually saying. Uh, puppeteering refers to not just manipulations of the face or mouth, but of full body movements um, using AI algorithms. Then we get into um, some perhaps less familiar terms, uh, image sen synthesis or image generation, which is a technique utilizing AI to generate entirely new videos or images, rather than uh, the first few on this list, which are typically using existing content, but merging it or blending it in some way. Voice cloning is uh, essentially teaching an AI algorithm how to mimic somebody's voice. Um, so it's based on an individual's voice recordings and then synthesizing that uh, to, to mimic it. And we have already seen this technology used to perpetuate financial fraud, where a victim is asked to wire money or make a payment <laughs> by a synthetic voice that sounds like their superior or someone in a position of authority. Um, and then finally, text generation, which might not be something that you initially associate with deep fakes, um, but the same uh, underlying technology can be used to generate text that is increasingly almost indistinguishable from human generated content. So just providing a, a very simple diagram of how deep fakes are created, um, they use a technology called generative adversarial networks or GANs. And GANs are composed of two AI algorithms, the generator and the discriminator. The generator's job is to try to create an image, a, a fake image, a falsified image, realistic enough to fool the discriminator into classifying it as real. So the discriminator is tra uh, trained using real images, such as real, you know, real human faces to identify certain features that would classify a human face, you know, eyes, eyebrows, nose, whatever. So it learns these features Meanwhile, the generator is creating a you know, falsified version of this and feeding it into the discriminator uh, to try to trick it into classifying it as real. And this uh, technique is what makes it especially difficult to develop detection technology um, since these algorithms are uh, getting better and better at what they do over time. So any detection technology that you release to try to identify a deep fake uh, has a certain shelf life before it is pulled in by the generator and you know, used to create an even more sophisticated deep fake. So this is one of the challenges as we'll talk about later with, with detection technology. Now, um, as I've already said, the underlying technology that is used to create deep fakes is not inherently malicious. And the solution is not as simple as banning all deep fake technology. Um, as with many new and innovative technologies, we have to just think about guardrails to establish what is acceptable and unacceptable use cases of this technology. Synthetic media has clear benefits in areas like accessibility, education, artistic expression, uh, marketing and engagement, and scientific research. In particular, I would highlight that this technology is already used to make important strides in accessibility and uh, achieving equity for people with disabilities. Two examples of this are synthetic voice technology, uh, which has become increasingly smarter and more affordable and more customizable for the users who need them. Um, another example at Microsoft is our seeing AI technology, uh, which is used to help people with visual impairments um, narrate the world around them, describe situations, describe objects, um, and, and help uh, achieve accessibility in that way. In education and artistic expression, synthetic, synthetic media can help uh, enhance learning experiences, make them more customized. Um, a great example of this is in Florida. The Salvador Dali Museum actually uses an AI-generated Salvador Dali to interact with visitors, um, which is a cool application. 
Um, synthetic media has also given us movies like Avatar, which uh, you can decide if that is a positive or negative use case there. Um, and in terms of reach and engagement, I think the, the best example of this that we've seen is the politician that I shared in India um, who translated his speeches into different languages. Um, and as I mentioned on that side, that does raise some ethical issues, but um, I think that is an interesting use of this technology. Um, and then finally, there's uh, many applications in scientific and medical research of uh, AI technology. But uh, just as it can be used to improve people's lives, uh, this same technology can be weaponized by nefarious actors to inflict harm. And this slide is really showing the, the full spectrum of what we think uh, as the Defending Democracy team, these risks are from the individual level up to the societal level. The weaponization of deep fakes can have a tremendous impact on both economy and national security um, and is unfortunately likely to continue to erode uh, the public's declining trust in media and journalism. So as I've already mentioned, the very first use case of malicious synthetic media was seen in non-consensual pornography. Um, and I think this will actually use the same uh, statistic from Sensity AI that 90% uh, of, uh, or 96% of deep fake content currently is pornographic. And of that 90% targets women. So while our team, the Defending Democracy team focuses on political use cases of this technology, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that this technology disproportionately impacts certain groups. And any solutions that we're developing need to uh, not only help the political customers that we work with, but other victims of this technology as well. Um, looking at the societal level, deep fakes uh, pose the risk of exacerbating existing societal divisions and polarization um, by causing people to be critical of things simply because they don't agree with them um, or even just critical of everything that they see in general. Um, and I'll talk about this a little more on the next slide, but this contributes to a culture of factual relativism or the idea that the truth is relative. And I think this is an issue that we're already seeing uh, play out in the US. Deep fakes can also pose a risk to security and safety um, by causing confusion, uncertainty, even chaos around something that is rapidly unfolding, like breaking news, a national emergency. Um, it can exacerbate uh, confusion in these situations. There's also um, potential impacts to business and to the economy. Um, audio deepfakes can and have already been used to facilitate financial fraud or solicit business secrets. Um, they can also cause reputational damage to a business executive uh, or by extension, the company itself. Uh, one that I've seen in the past 24 hours, which is not a deep fake, at least to my knowledge, is the Cinnamon Toast Crunch scandal, um, where the uh, poster of that on Twitter was you know, saying, this is not disinformation, this is real. Um, but this is an example where it's easy to see how a malicious actor could fabricate a story like this and use it to try to take down a competitor. Um, so just an example of a potential business application. Um, and then this brings us up to the level of uh, democracy and journalism uh, more broadly, where deep fakes have the potential to erode trust in processes and institutions that underpin our democracy. They distort um, free and fair democratic discourse they disrupt people's right to access authentic information. Um, and it almost goes without saying that a well-timed deep fake could sabotage a political candidate um, or even alter the course of an election. Nina Jankowitz, who is a renowned researcher in this space, uh, has written about uh, the likelihood that the first major political deep fake we see will be attempting to sabotage a female candidate um, given the overwhelming use case of this technology today in non-consensual pornography. So that is uh, an overview of how we are thinking about the harms. Um, I do want to dive a little bit more into uh, one area that we think is uh, particularly alarming and that is the liar's dividend and truth skepticism. Um, this is a term that was coined recently by professors Bobby Chesney and Danielle Citron. They are uh, well-established, um, well-known researchers in this space um, and use the term liar's dividend to describe how anyone with the very existence of deepfakes, anyone can question the authenticity of media, even if it's genuine. 
So it provides almost a loophole for somebody who's trying to claim that a piece of content, including them, you know, might be false, uh, might be a deep fake, um, and distracts from the actual content itself. Um, and this is a, a particularly dangerous aspect of this technology that it doesn't even have to be a sophisticated deep fake to, uh, to impact people or impact democracy. Um, it doesn't have to be a deep fake at all, but the fact that somebody could claim that the content is fake, uh, you know, kind of distracts from the actual conversation. Um, so in the solutions that we're developing, well, we think that, you know, education and awareness are a hugely critical piece of um, countering deep fakes we also have to be careful not to make people so skeptical and so critical that they start to lose faith in trusted sources of information and lose faith in everything that they see, um, which we'll, we'll talk about this more when we jump into our solutions. Um, but this is why we think it's important not only to detect um, what's fake, but also develop technology that helps verify and authenticate the things that are real. And these sorts of solutions are what we need to think about in terms of restoring trust and resilience in the media ecosystem. So turning to how do we actually develop effective responses to deep fakes, um, there's two primary kind of ways of thinking about responses, uh, reducing exposure and reducing belief. Of course, we want to try to reduce people's exposure to inauthentic and potentially damaging content, but this is always going to be a cat and mouse game um, where we're always trying to keep up with people who are generating uh, malicious content. And so this is where the reducing belief side of things really comes in through media literacy efforts um, to teach people how to think critically about the content they're encountering online. Um, reducing exposure includes uh, several different strategies that are included on this slide. Um, outright content removal, downranking low authority content and promoting high authority content, um, controlling the virality of content and slowing down re-uploads. All of these strategies serve to demonetize and disincentivize bad actors by reducing the likelihood that their content will actually reach the intended audience at scale. Um, alongside these techniques, you have probably seen um, some of the efforts to reduce belief on social media platforms, uh, which include labeling false or misleading content, uh, providing additional context, links to further information. And then a really important part of this conversation, which is, um, expanding civic education and curriculum for students to include good digital citizenship and responsible behavior online. So now I will turn to um, how the Defending Democracy program is thinking about uh, responding to deep fakes and I'll touch briefly on our media literacy solutions before um, Ashish will chime in on some of our technology responses and uh, efforts around policy and legislation. So. This is a challenge um, that I think, as you've seen, this requires a multifaceted, multi-stakeholder approach. There's no one response that could solve the issues posed by deep fakes. Um, the first of these is media literacy. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's important that we think about this, you know, from the student level to the senior level, everyone needs to be inoculated against um, the, the impacts of disinformation and deep fakes. I think especially with media literacy, there's an, a vital role for journalists to play and the media um, in terms of ensuring the transparency and integrity of their publications and helping to build uh, what I mentioned earlier, sort of that resilience in the media ecosystem. Media literacy is especially important to us in an elections context um, in terms of ensuring that voters have access to information and are able to make informed decisions about policy issues and candidates. Um, the next set of responses here is both um, policies set by the platforms themselves and uh, hand in hand with that, uh, you know, state and federal legislation um, around synthetic media. So uh, several countries around the world have started to consider new laws to regulate synthetic media, but there's still a need for meaningful legislation in this space that disincentivizes the creation and distribution of deep fakes. Alongside this, uh, the technology companies and social media platforms themselves should have clear and transparent policies around the creation and distribution of deep fakes on their platforms. And then finally, um, technology solutions uh, can be divided into three categories, detection, authentication, and provenance. Um, and Ashish will dive further into all of the things that we are working on uh, with our team, but just uh, as a quick overview, 
detection technologies, as the name implies, help us uh, detect disinformation and deep fake content that already exists, while authentication and provenance technology is intended to support verifying authentic media. Um, so that is, uh, you can think of that as like a digital watermark to verify that a piece of content is authentic from when it's captured, uh, either a photo or video at the point of capture, all the way to the end user when they're viewing that content. So, um, like I said, I will talk briefly about our media literacy solutions. The first of which is um, a quiz that we released ahead of the US elections last year called Spot the Deepfake. Um, this is a 10 question online quiz that we intended to um, be sort of an engaging way to educate people about synthetic media technology. Um, we partnered with the University of Washington, Sensity AI and USA Today on this effort uh, to really bring in perspectives from academia, from the media, and then of course from tech uh, to figure out the best way to communicate this information in, in a manner that kept it, you know, somewhat lighthearted and engaging, but also help people understand a very complex issue area. So I would encourage you to try it out for yourself. The link is on, is on the slide. Um, we uh, saw really great success with, with this first quiz that we released, and we actually subsequently released a second one uh, focusing more on news literacy, um, and that one is called Know My News. Um, so you can check both of those quizzes out maybe, maybe after the webinar. Um, the last thing that I will cover is um, a training curriculum that we are working on with uh, PolitiFact out of the Pointer Institute. And this is a um, resource that is intended to address both cybersecurity threats and disinformation threats uh, together referred to as hybrid threats. Um, this curriculum includes different modules that can be combined and reorganized depending on who the audience is. And we've especially designed this with uh, some of our high risk customers in mind. So political campaigns, political parties, uh, election administrators, um, to really help them understand how these two issues are often used uh, in concert with each other. Um, and the actors are deploying these techniques sort of in parallel. Um, another way to think about it is sort of cyber hacking and cognitive hacking. So one is an attempt to disrupt computer systems. One is an attempt to disrupt people's opinions and belief systems. Um, so these trainings uh, are aimed at not only explaining these issues, but also providing tangible resources for the audience to uh, identify and mitigate these threats. So these are just some of the main media literacy areas that we've been involved in. Uh, there's certainly a lot of room for innovation in this space um, and something that, that we look forward to continuing to work on. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Ashish to talk about some of our technology solutions. Oh, I think you're on mute, Ashish. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Sorry about that. I it looks like the the mute button goes when you when you share your screen. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, yeah, hey, so thank you, Alyssa, uh, for setting it up. I would uh, focus on uh, technology solutions and and media uh, and platform policies and legislation. Uh, some of the innovation that Microsoft is doing, especially around technology, we being the technology company, uh, we've been actually looking at this issue area for the last two and a half years since uh, uh, 2018. And one thing we quickly realized is, is a technology is, uh, it's very hard to actually solve uh, the issue of deep fakes uh, using technology because it's a social technical problem which we're trying to do. So that's why Alyssa, when she said that we need a multi-facet, multi-stakeholder uh, you know, stakeholder solution, uh, we, we not only mean that, but we also collaborate uh, for our, all our solutions uh, across industry, with think tanks, with civil society, and and public partner uh, public private uh, partnership. Uh, so technical solutions, detection, authentication, and provenance. Uh, I'll go a bit deeper into what I mean when I say detection. So detection technologies, as Alyssa said, it's it's very hard essentially 
because a detector or detection technology can be used to improve creation of a deep fake, right? An example could be, uh, which was very first example of a detector that came off, came from a university, I think it was NYU or, or, or somewhere, uh, an, an academic researcher actually said, hey, you know, deep fakes which are created, actually you can detect them that they are not blinking eyes, essentially, because the, so, so that was very early detector. And as soon as that detector algorithm was, was released, which would detect if the eyes were blinking or not, uh, the creators of, of the, you know, they were very quickly adapt and then create a defects would, which would blink eyes, right? So, so the whole idea is that detector technology actually can in fact help to improve creation of, of, of some defects, which in some cases like the positive use cases is a great thing, but the weaponization of defects for malicious actors, you know, it's, it's a bad thing. So detect, detection uh, has a shelf life. When we talk about detection, we typically categorize them into these four buckets. Uh, Artifact-based detection, which is like, you know, uh, you can, technology can detect if there are biological signals. I was talking about uh, uh, eye blinking. There are other uh, technology or algorithms out there which can actually figure out if there was a blending done in the image. So that if you can figure out where the blending lines are, then you can say, hey, this was a fake or not. Uh, the other uh, mechanism of inconsistencies. So uh, you can actually see the, the lip syncing may not be as perfect. Uh, at the temporal awareness, which what I mean by that is the video is, is actually has a timeline to it. And some of the frames actually may not be consistent with, with the, the previous or the, uh, the next frame, essentially you have to work uh, to create fake of every frame. And sometimes those inconsistencies can give away that the video is fake or not. Uh, then there is a technology where uh, the GANs as they generate fakes uh, could actually embed a frame uh, fingerprint that can be then detected that this particular video or image was generated by GAN. So there, there are a couple of techniques which are actually inconsistency based techniques which can help detect. Uh, semantic one is an interesting one because most of these, these things are generated by AI and AI as a black box fails miserably in some time. So, you know, we have seen examples of, of, of deep fakes which are inconsistent, not just temporally, but you know, you'll see like the the hair strands uh, strands could be inconsistent, uh, uh, or you know, in fact, one of the examples is is a fa uh, a fake of a of a woman where uh, inconsistent earrings, essentially, you know, different earrings, uh, which sometimes can give away, you know, that that something is fake or not. And the last one is, you know, there are some some uh, research going on uh, to use deep neural networks or DNNs to actually look into uh, the, the video itself using AI and see if it was uh, based on some inconsistencies as well as semantic inconsistencies, but artifact inconsistencies, physical in inconsistencies as well, uh, light on the face, you know, how the eyes light up or your facial movement, everything together using AI uh, can be used uh, to detect uh, defects. But I would caveat with this end of this slide with this notion that deep fake technologies are not perfect, detection technologies are not perfect. Uh, in fact, they have a very short uh, shelf life. Uh, you may read something very interesting come out, let's say tomorrow uh, as a detector that detects 95% of deep fakes and a couple of days it will actually can detect zero of them. Right? So that's how, how rapidly the technology is, is improving. So detection is time bound, a snapshot of a solution. What is, so, so one thing that we as Microsoft actually uh, announced is called Microsoft Video Authenticator. Before the US uh, 2020 election, uh, we, uh, so again, this is just a very uh, quick snapshot of how, uh, a very simplistic example on how a face deep fake is created. So you essentially, you detect an image, you, you manipulate it, and then you mask the image so that you can remove any inconsistencies and then you publish, right? So typically, very simplistically, there are three steps to create a deep fake. It is more nuanced, it is more 
in depth than that, but you know, if you just think about three steps, these are the three steps, detect, manipulate, and blend. What our technology was able to do is in, this, uh, in the blending step, in the last step, uh, the technology can actually detect if there was a blending was done with, with faces or not. And based on that, we were able to actually with a high level of confidence uh, could detect that something was fake or not. Now, again, uh, time bound solution. There was some, uh, we were, we actually, our results were pretty, pretty good uh, based on what we saw at that point in time. But at this point, you know, it, it, it does work, but you know, I, I'm not sure if it is like consistency would, would keep on giving good results as the time progresses. Uh, this is an example uh, that I want to show very quickly. So this is something that I created with, with right consent uh, from a, a professor at, at University of Washington, Jemin West and using Mr. Rogers video and created a deep fake. Uh, and obviously we, we took the right consent, not only from the person whose face we, was off, uh, we, uh, we put in front uh, uh, on top of Mr. Rogers, but also made sure that we had the, the right to use Mr. Rogers uh, video. So any deep fake that, that anyone wants to create, you know, you have to make sure that you have the rights to do so. Uh, uh, so with, with, with our technology, this is just an example on, on how, how our technology works. So this was Mr. Rogers' uh, real face. And as you can see, as the video progresses, uh, our technology can actually, with a high level of confidence, can say, hey, there's no blending around the face. Uh, and that's what this, this, this demonstration is. Now, you may see a flicker of red. And that is because the AI technologies are not 100% uh, accurate. So you may see flicker of, uh, of, of reds, uh, but overall, if you combine all the confidence scores, this would give a very high level of confidence that this is uh, not a deep fake. Uh, this is the fake example, and you would see more reds than green here. And again, the idea is that as, as our technology processes each frame in the video, it can, it can figure out the blending boundary and can give you, uh, can give a high level of confidence that this was actually manipulated uh, frame, not a, a, a real uh, Mr. Rogers uh, face. Uh, so, you know, so that is just one of the examples. We, we, we keep on pushing our boundaries and, and trying to figure out what, what other creative ways or, or detecting technologies that we can bring to market. Uh, we do partner with the, with the industry uh, and, and the, the video authenticator technology was uh, uh, the way we actually went to market or gave access to the technology was through our partnership with Reality Defender which, was a, which, is, which uh, is a nonprofit uh, uh, which was stood up before the elections to give uh, access to cam political campaigns, journalism and other uh, uh, organizations access to this technology to detect defects. The second thing uh, I wanna again go is like the short-term solution detection, long-term solution. And this is where uh, we are focusing a lot is authentication and provenance. And the simple idea is that if, if we can figure out where the origins of that video, uh, uh, is, where, 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 where was the video originated, where it is coming from, and who uh, is the uh, authoritative source behind that piece of media, right? Who has created it? If we can actually pro prove that, then we can use the right kind of countermeasures at the end point or at the point of consumption of that particular media. Uh, and so Microsoft, uh, we've been working on this technology that was invented in Microsoft Research uh, called uh, AMP or uh, uh, Authentication by Media Provenance. Uh, we work with BBC and others to uh, create project origin. I should actually go to the next slide. Uh, because that would give that, that, that's what, it, this talks about project origin. So we worked with BBC, CBC, and Radio Canada, New York Times uh, to bring this technology to market. And the idea is that if we can put a piece of uh, uh, 
signal, essentially a fingerprint or a watermark in the piece of media when it is published and can ensure that the, that signal is not tampered with, then at the end point or the consumption point, we can actually look at the signal and be very confident that this media was not manipulated. Uh, as well as we know who the, who the creator or publisher of this media is. And then we can do again, the right kind of, uh, as Alyssa was talking about reducing uh, exposure and reducing belief, we can actually take the right kind of approach on what to do with this media, as long as we can trust that media, we know where it is coming from and it was not tampered. And that is the basic idea. We, uh, so uh, we were, uh, so again, I, I'm, I'm going a bit in te technology here. Uh, so, but, but to simplify, I, I'll just say this, uh, this is very similar to what we see on the browser with the padlock, right? I, I hope all of you see those padlocks in the address bar of every browser, which actually tells that the website uh, that, that you're consuming the information from is the data between the web server and your browser is encrypted and is not tampered with. And that padlock signifies that. What we are trying to do is on the same lines, uh, putting a signal in the media and then making sure that you have a padlock kind of experience in the browser and the signal lives and sits in the media itself. Now the signal, I've talked about signal, but what does that signal actually really is? So it is uh, the fingerprint of the media itself. And when we say fingerprint, essentially, uh, there are various ways to get a fingerprint, especially in video, you can actually hash the whole video, or you can actually, what we call a fragile watermarking. What that means is that minor manipulation of the video. So let's say dropping a few frames or fixing the lighting of the video and other things would not invalidate the, the watermark, but major manipulations will. Uh, so that also gives the creatives enough flexibility to make right adjustments in the piece of media without breaking that, that hash or fingerprint uh, when it goes. Otherwise, you know, uh, as we all know, all media typically goes through a processing pipeline, right? You know, you, have, you make minor touches to images, some fixing in, in the videos. Uh, we want to make sure that that does not impact uh, or uh, fail that signal. So the, the fingerprint is part of the manifest or the signal. Uh, there's some metadata like where this is coming from, who is the author of this media uh, and other things. Uh, and if there are major edits, then we can also update that fingerprint as long as we know who is making the edits. And which is good because if, uh, if, if a malicious actor actually makes those edits, then they would have to sign this media by their name. So essentially we know if the edits were made, who made those edits. And if there were some, some, some real uh, uh, edits were made, let's say in news publishing business where you know, the whole video could be an hour, but you know, in new segments, you only show a couple of minutes of that video even that would be fine as long as we know who is editing and, and, and why they are editing. And that could be part of the signal. Uh, and the last thing is this, uh, the signature and the receipt, which you can actually go back and like in padlock, I don't know if you have tried that, but when you click on the padlock in the browser, you can see uh, if the certificate is valid, who signed the certificate, where this information is coming from in the browser context you'll have similar kind of features in the media context as well. Uh, so as we were working on project origin, Adobe, uh, you know, the, the creators of Photoshop uh, were actually doing something similar uh, where they wanted to actually solve this problem with a similar approach for images uh, and creatives who use their tools uh, to manipulate and, and touch images and, and, and do interesting uh, stuff. Uh, so at that point, we realized, and this was like an almost 18 months back. So we realized that, hey, we were working on similar kind of approaches, similar technologies. Our focus was a bit different. So we ended up actually uh, collaborating in the process. And, and last month, we announced a standards body called C2PA, or Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. And the idea there is that 
as we we were both taking similar approaches, maybe it actually makes sense to uh, create a standards body similar to again I go back to my padlock example similar to what what we have now where every browser actually has that standard followed. Uh, every web server follows that standard. We actually created this this consortium or this coalition. Uh, sorry, I thought I had a slide uh, there uh, with Intel, ARM, uh, Trupic, BBC, Adobe, Microsoft, as well as uh, we are openly and aggressively recruiting other partners, social media and other tech companies to be part of the standards body so that we can actually have a long-term solution for media authentication and provenance, similar to what we have for browsers and, and, and secure uh, uh, traffic on, and on the internet. I want to quickly touch upon legislation and platform policies, which is because you know I think that is also an important countermeasure. Uh, so we we do track as 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 a team uh, what is going on on around legislations and regulations across the globe in the U.S. as well as you know across the globe as and and focus in the U.S. a bit more because we are here. Uh, so uh, as you can see in the deck, we, uh, there are nine states that have uh, introduced legislation. Uh, there are uh, three bills uh, have been introduced in the house. Uh, and, uh, and then there are other countries outside of the US who are actually either have passed or actively thinking about passing regulations around defects. Now, I want to actually make sure that that, that legislation is not the, the, the only answer here, right? You know, we can also see that these legislation could be challenged, uh, especially in, in democratic societies as, uh, you know, uh, with an argument that this may be actually impeding on the freedom of expression and speech, uh, as well as on the other side, authoritarian regimes actually can use regulations and legislation to suppress dissent uh, and silence voices uh, which actually could be challenging to that regime. So, so, so we have to just make sure that yes, we are tracking them, and, and then, uh, but, but we have to also understand that that even legislations can be misconstrued or can be used for bad purposes. Uh, the other side we also do is platform policies, not only Microsoft policies on how we we treat disinformation and defects on our platform, but we also sometimes advise and be in the same room as other platforms are talking about how they would uh, have their policies for defects and, and, and disinformation. Uh, the challenge that we see is the policies vary across social media platform, the same kind of content uh, uh, would, ha would, ha would receive different treatments uh, on, on YouTube and Facebook and, and Twitter differently. Yes, they would all take actions, but the actions actually are not consistent. Uh, uh, lately, we have seen a, 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 a lot of uh, interest as well as uh, implementation on labeling and providing context in social media platform, which is uh, again with the policies that they announce. Uh, but the idea is that we, we actually want to propose uh, you know, or, and there are some, some uh, initiatives going on where we can have a common set of uh, uh, principles or, or guidelines, essentially code of conduct on how all media, social media platform, tech companies, as well as news media organizations should treat defects and how they should actually make sure that, that they have a consistent policy on the treatment, but also consistent policy on uh, with transparency uh, uh, on, on these issues. Lastly, uh, I think we are, we are right about time. I want to call out uh, some of the things that, that, that we also think a, a lot about is ethics of, around deep fakes. Uh, as we, we, whenever we talk about malicious uh, use of deep fakes, uh, you know, some, some use cases are very cut and dry, uh, unethical. You, know, you can treat them unethically or you can call them for, for their ethics compromise of ethics, but then there's some uh, are not as easy, especially the, the synthetic reconstruction of disease is, is actually a very, very challenging consideration of synthetic media, positive use case, but you know, 
a very fine line on can you use someone's likeness after they're passed on. So, uh, so, so again, want to make sure that that we also understand that, and, and as well as spend some time understanding the ethics around defects. Uh, we also want to call out ethical considerations for the technology solutions because, you know, as we talked about detection, authentication, provenance, we want to make sure that we, cons because it's an AI technology uh, and black box technologies obviously uh, have all kinds of ethical considerations and ethical issues, uh, even for detection and removal of defects and all those things that we want to do for positive use cases. Uh, we should be uh, thinking very, very carefully about uh, if we were to create tools to detect, you know, are we doing it transparently? Uh, the detection algorithm, uh, is, it, is it not disproportionately uh, has any bias uh, of the faces that it sees, right? Because we, we, it can happen, right? Uh, so make sure that 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 the the ethical consideration of the tools do touch privacy, security, reliability, fairness, inclusiveness, and more importantly, whatever we we do, uh, we should actually do transparently and with accountability. Uh, so with that, the couple of recommendations, and this is my last slide, I promise. Uh, so the recommendations are, uh, you know, let's actually uh, engage. Uh, uh, for media literacy efforts, uh, teach consumers of information the the right tools uh, to to be to to consume that information, uh, and be discern uh, and and be create citizen, uh, good citizens of the information. Uh, uh, hopefully, you know they they understand uh, the challenges of 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 this information and not just. Uh, share it on social media as soon as they see something that actually aligns with their beliefs. Uh, uh, there is a lot of research that needs to be done as well, both in the harms and threat modeling, but also, you know, how these countermeasures uh, do work. Uh, because lately there have been a lot of push around, around providing context and labeling, but there is some research which actually came out last two, week, two weeks back, which says labeling actually some, most of the time does not work at all. So, so there's a lot of need for research, uh, further research on how people consume information uh, and what triggers them to actually uh, sometimes even spread disinformation. Uh, standardization, we talked about that, we are working towards that. And as well as keep on innovating, right? You know, I think it's a cat and mouse game which we want to win at the end of the day, right? Uh, so, so we have to keep on, uh, you know, innovating both uh, to understand the issue area, build the right threat modeling and harms framework, mitigate the threat, but also innovate for the positive use cases of synthetic media. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, we can open for question. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ashish and Alyssa. That was an excellent presentation. So much great information there. And I'll just start with the first question. Since we have so many journalists here in the audience, and one of your recommendations is education, what can journalists do to educate themselves about deep fakes and educate the public? And how should they uh, be responding to deep fakes when they start you know, appearing much more regularly in our information ecosystem. Yeah, I can, I can jump in and take that. Um, so like we said, I think uh, working with journalists in the media is a hugely important part of the solution. Um, one of the uh, things that we, that we see um, you know, when covering deep fakes, making sure that you're not amplifying the false content, right? And so always giving um, the appropriate uh, explanation and context without amplifying the disinformation itself, right? And I think there's no one solution for how to do that, but that's certainly a consideration that we see in coverage of deep fakes uh, in a way that isn't further amplifying the uh, message that the bad actor wants to convey. Um, you know, I think another related issue in this space is the uh, decline in local newsrooms. Um, and so wherever we can, um, you know, supporting uh, local newsrooms uh, making sure that there's not news deserts where people don't have 
any access to information besides social media. Um, and so I think really supporting a robust media ecosystem is an important part of this solution um, as well. So um, Ashish, anything else to add on that? No, I think you're right, you know, that sometimes, uh, especially paying careful attention to how to report on a, on a disinformation and, and, and be fake story is, is very, very important. I think there's, there's this, uh, this framework of uh, truth sandwich, right? Where you actually report on, on, uh, on, on information, but then you actually also talk about, you know, the counter it essentially. And so, so, so those are some of the frameworks which are out there. Uh, but want to make sure that 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 we are spreading the right awareness for journalism for absolutely right and and there are a lot of efforts going on as well right facebook with reuters actually published a, a curriculum for journalists we actually uh, are doing a lot of work as well for journalism and 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 and, and local newsrooms uh, i think we have to consciously also think about uh, civic education uh, and start it early. Uh, I, I personally think that, that we should use uh, some kind of curriculum around disinformation, misinformation uh, as part of our civic education early in the schools. Uh, you're preaching to the choir. I teach a news literacy course at Hunter College, and it could not be more important right now. Um, one other question, then we're going to uh, open it up to the audience. As usual, the law is lagging two steps behind technology here. You mentioned that we need you know, to look at legislation, but what kind of laws are we looking at? Laws to restrict the use of deep face or um, laws you know, that incorporate some of the standards that you talked about, what's going to work best with this new technology? So, so I think the, the laws to restrict defects for a certain scenario, the for certain issue areas is important, right? There cannot be a blanket regulation or a law that restricts uh, defects or synthetic media and because we did we did talk about some of the positive use cases in, in many other scenarios uh, what we are seeing right now is is regulations actually around uh, usage of defects uh, around elections uh, you know which is uh, I think some of the states have already passed that or before the 2020 elections uh, there are regulations uh, around around uh, you know the harms that it creates, especially around around pornography and, and others, which are I think one of the laws in Australia, which actually focuses on that. Uh, so for for specific topics or issue areas, uh, I think having the right regulation is is super helpful. Uh, to, to to your other part, uh, which I actually forgot what the other part of the question was. Sorry. Uh, well, just about standards, if we yeah, should have standards, some yes. kind of standards. Yes, and, and that is actually important as well. I think what we, so, so instead of regulations, I think it, it, it could be an industry framework for standards. And that's what we see, especially, uh, typically the industry would take lead in standards. We saw it with PCI, you know, where you have the online transactions, so PCI framework, and then eventually it became one of the, one of the regulations where, you know, banking industry or financial transactions on the internet. Uh, so that's where, where I think the C2PA thing would help is like bringing industry together and then having some kind of, uh, as we have the momentum around, around using a standard to verify authenticate media, uh, then you can have some regulation. You can say, hey, you know, uh, because now it is proven, most of the industry is together now, then it's easy to pass a regulation. Otherwise, you're force fitting a regulation where, you know, the, the standards may not be still, uh, uh, you know, complete. So, All right. Uh, Let's hear from our audience. Do we have any questions? Uh, we have one question from uh, Isabella. Uh, Isabella, are you here that you can ask your question? Oh, hi, can you listen to me? We can, yes. Uh, I would just like to know if, um, is it possible for us to find these images online and understand if they are a deep fake or not um, when we are doing journalism coverage? Uh, what are the ways for us to identify this with uh, media that's already 
um, available in the uh, online platforms. What are some tips for spotting them for the non-experts like us? <laughs> yeah, I know it is, it is, it is super hard. Uh, <laughs> let me start there. It is super hard. So if, if like you may get lucky by spotting chief fakes, uh, uh, you know, easily with your eyes, absolutely. But again, you may get lucky. Uh, the way the technology is, is going forward, detection is super hard. But with that said, what are the best practices? So the first thing I think is, which every one of you I'm sure already do, do does is reverse image search. If you find something, just go on Bing uh, as your as your uh, search engine of choice, uh, and then go to a reverse image search. You know, Bing and Google and others actually do have that. There are specialized tools like Tiny Eye and others which actually provide you that capability. So that's one. The other thing that, that you can do is uh, use tools to look at the EXIF data in the images. Again, uh, you may already be doing it, but there are tools where you can actually, they can process the image and can figure out the metadata of the image. So that metadata can give you some clues about, about the original, uh, who, where it was created, how it was created. Uh, and then, uh, so that those are the, the the tools that we can talk about. Uh, the other thing, which actually, there are some some work Microsoft is doing uh, as well as Jigsaw, uh, Google's uh, uh, company is doing. Uh, they have some interesting tools. Adobe has some interesting tools as well uh, that can help you to identify. But again, detection is is super hard, and you may just have to get lucky to find something that works for you. Most of your time detectors actually would not give you as, as robust confidence that it was fake or not. Mm. If I can just add to that, just some general, you know, I think this audience is journalists and probably already knows this, but, um, you know, tracing back to the original source of content and then seeing if you can verify and find other um, coverage of that, you know, whatever the content is, that's something that not just for deep fakes, but for disinformation in general, we reinforce with a lot of audiences is, can you find the original source of who shared it? And then can you find, you know, cross-reference other sources that are saying the same thing? Um, so like I said, probably uh, stuff you're already familiar with, but um, that's just good media literacy in general. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question from the audience? 